Greetings and blessings from the south suburbs of Chicago. And welcome to the Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, where the lost can be found, where the dying can receive life, and where the saints can be encouraged. The church of love. Welcome to the church of love. The church of love. Good evening, brothers and sisters of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood. I pray that you are doing well during this evening of October the 13th. I certainly pray that you are continuing to remain strong in the Lord. And I just want to welcome each and every one of our members and to welcome all of our brothers and sisters who are joining us from wherever you may be watching, from wherever you may be enjoying this Bible study, we welcome you. We thank God for you. You are certainly welcome amongst us, and we welcome you as members of our church family. And I certainly pray again that the Holy Spirit is continuing to keep you uplifted, to keep you encouraged, and to keep you strengthened. This evening, we're going to return to Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And we're going to look at Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to look at that chapter in its entirety, just to examine what Paul specifically had to say as his final words of encouragement, and we're going to look at his final admonishment and salutation to the church in Galatia. And I have no doubt that we will find that within Paul's teaching, we're going to see some insights that we can apply in our daily living and insights that will also help us to encourage others, no matter where they may be during their situation in life, no matter what they may be going through. And so we thank God again for the abundant power of his word. And again, I thank God for you joining with me this evening as we all worship and study our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, before we proceed, we want to proceed asking for the guidance and the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you this evening that you have seen fit to bless us with the presence of your word. God, I thank you that you have continued and continue to watch over each and every member of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood. Lord, I pray that as we journey through this sixth chapter of Galatians, that we will discover, that we will unearth, that we will be able to mine insights and helpful observations that we can apply to our heart, that we can apply to our mind, that we can apply to our deeds. God, we pray now that as we proceed this evening, as we worship you, through the study of your word, that you will be in our midst and that your presence will guide us in our understanding. This and all things we ask in the almighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And so this evening, again, we're going to journey into um, the sixth chapter of Galatians. And our lesson title is simply Help a Brother and a Sister Out. What we're going to find in this chapter is Paul is encouraging the members of this church who had been discouraged by what were called the circumcised faction, a member of Christians who, due to having grown up in the Jewish tradition and having a very clear understanding of the relationship of the Abrahamic covenant to the fulfillment of God in the person of Jesus Christ, and who had a very clear understanding of how the old covenant was fulfilled in the new covenant, they began to criticize and they began to unfairly castigate the Gentile members of the church who did not have this same intuitive and this same foundational understanding that members of the Jewish tradition had. And so there were some Christians not all, but there were some Christians who had this understanding of this tradition who were criticizing Gentiles. And what Paul wanted to do was to encourage them and to remind them that the crucifixion of Jesus is all the reason that they had to have full confidence in their faith and that there was no need for them to undergo any rituals or to undergo any ceremonial rites because what Jesus had done on the cross had secured for them for all time eternal life. So 
The first thing we're going to see here as we journey and look at verses 1 through 8, we're going to see that in helping one another, we want to first help one another through empathy. Of course, the difference between empathy and sympathy is empathy means that you have had an experience that allows you to understand firsthand what someone is going through. So it's not only that you pity them, and when you sympathize someone, you, you, you pity them, and you certainly feel sad for them. But when you empathize, you feel sad for them because you know firsthand. You know you have a firsthand experience of what someone is going through. And so Paul is going to speak to them from the standpoint of empathy. So let us journey now and look at these first eight verses. Verse 1 reads, My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think that they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let's go back and, and look at these verses a little bit. I want to go back first to verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. There is this notion of empathy. Bear one another's burdens. In other words, when you see someone suffering, Take a moment to remember how you suffered in the same way that they have suffered or in a similar way and relate to people from that place of pain instead of from a place of survival. Take yourself back to that place of pain. The great boxer Floyd Patterson once said of Mike Tyson when Mike Tyson was going through a number of problems after he was released from jail. Floyd Patterson said, Mike, I've never met you personally, but... In seeing your life and knowing that you and I were both trained by custom auto, that we had the same trainer, I imagine that you grew up the way that I grew up. So, Mike, I want you to go back. When you have an opportunity, go back. Go back to the dumpsters that you used to eat from. Go back to the places where you had to beg for a couch to sleep on. Go back to the foster homes. Go back to the group homes. Go back to the juvenile detention centers. Go back to those places and remember what you had to go through to become who you are. And when you go back to those places, then you will remember who you are and what you went through so that you can become who you're supposed to be. Had Floyd Patterson not gone through a similar experience, he would not have been able to give that type of advice. That was the advice of someone who had gone through what Mike Tyson had gone through. And Mike Tyson being a, a boxing historian and aficionado, as a matter of fact, Mike Tyson at one point even enrolled in school just to go back and study history because he's so fascinated by history as it relates to pugilism, that is boxing. And so because he respected Floyd Patterson so much, he reached out to him and he did just that. He went back to those places. So Paul is saying, bear one another's burdens Make sure that you remember when you were hungry, when you were sick, when you were suffering, when you were hurt, and relate to people in that way. And it's much easier to love people when you relate to them from that place of sameness, from that place of oneness, when you remember what you went through. Um, also to that point, as he says, bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Paul, in other places throughout his letters, says the law of Christ is love. So in order to fulfill the law of Christ, in order to love one another, I was watching a story that occurred a few weeks ago in which there were um, some Trump supporters who had gone to Washington, D.C. And they had gone to Washington, D.C., and they were rallying in favor of President Trump. 
And one of these Trump supporters um, had to find a place to get lunch, and so he sat down to get lunch, and he was speaking with his server, and his server was a Democrat, and he was a Trump supporter. She was polite to him, he was polite to her, and they had a conversation, and what he did on a $75 bill, he left a tip of $450. And he wrote a little note saying, you and I were brought up differently, raised differently, we live in different communities, and we believe different things. I hope and I wish that more people throughout America could do what we just did, which is to have a conversation. And I think if more people could just have a conversation, no matter what we believe and no matter where we're from, then America will be better off. Amazingly, um, there's a certain power that citizens and residents have that many times, sometimes leaders don't have, which is the ability to sit down and bear one another's burdens. The ability to sit down and realize someone else is going through what I've gone through. And if I can just take a moment to realize they understand my pain. They understand what it is that I'm going through. And if we understand that we understand one another's pain, then we can, as Paul says, fulfill the law of Christ, which is love. Um, I also then want to um, just look at for a moment, verse 6, those who are taught the word must share. And the word for share there is... Quononeo. And this might look familiar. As we've seen, quononia. So quononia typically is community or fellowship, as in a fellowship. So it's a noun. Quaneo speaks of sharing in community. Sharing in community. So Quaneo, he's saying share in community. And he says in verse six, those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. So he's saying there should be a relationship between the leaders of the church and the people where they share in the good things, that they share as, as equals. So he uses the word quaneo there. Um, since we're dabbling in Greek a little bit, then let us look at the most famous verses here. Verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for you reap. You reap. And the word for reap there is a fairly common Greek word. Terezo. Um, this essentially is gather, which is the opposite of spero. which is to spread. So you gather whatever you spread. You gather whatever you spread. You reap whatever you sow. If you are spreading something, that's what you're going to gather. Um, what Paul also does here, he's being very Matthean. If you've read the Gospel of Matthew, you will realize that Paul is appropriating a lot of Matthean language. And Matthew 6, 25 and 26, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So as Jesus uses the word sow and reap, and then even more specifically, gather, Paul is appropriating that language from the Christ, and he's using it as it applies to how people treat one another. In other words, whatever you send out is what you're going to gather. So he even goes as far as to say if you sow corruption, you're going to reap corruption. If you sow goodness and righteousness, you're going to reap goodness and righteousness. Um, now let us um, look at verses 9 through 16 here. 
And again, staying with this theme of helping one another. So we've looked at how we help one another through empathy. Now we're going to look at how we help one another through service. So verse 9 reads, so let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time. Again, we will gather at harvest time if we do not give up. Verse 10, so then whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all and especially for those of the family of faith. Okay, so now we come to what's called the final salutation, admonition, and benediction. Um, The word benediction, um, just a little bit of Latin here, bene decere, which basically means well speaking or a good word. Say a good word. A benediction is a good word. It's a blessing. A benediction also functions as an invocation. So typically, um, especially in the Baptist tradition, we start service with an invocation. That would be the first prayer of the service that invokes the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the benediction, the good word, invokes the power of the Holy Spirit to travel with us. So we invoke the Spirit into the service, and then we invoke the Spirit to rest upon our shoulders and to walk with us as we leave the service. And that's what Paul offers here. But he also offers an admonition, which would be a cautious warning but a cautious warning towards encouragement. So you're encouraging someone, but also having them to be mindful of certain things. So he's doing both of those. So verses 11 through 16. Verse 11, he says, See what large letters I make when I'm writing in my own hand. So this is an authentic letter here. Verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing. And this is the Greek word here, Euprosopeo, which means to please. This is another Pauline word. He talks about people being people pleasers or literally man pleasers. Those who want to make a good showing, those who want to please others in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So this goes back to what I mentioned at the outset of the lesson, that this battle of what was called the circumcised faction. And you might recall that Peter, at a certain point, was even leading that faction, and then he later changes. But Paul is basically saying the cross took the place of circumcision. And so he's encouraging them, but also warning them, do not try to please people. And there are other people criticizing you who want to please people. So don't mind the people. Don't put your mind towards them. He goes on to say, verse 13, even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. But a new creation is everything. And for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So let's unpack verse 14, because verse 14 is going to set the framework for what Paul is going to write to the Corinthians and what we're going to explore in our next lesson. Paul says, may I never boast of anything. So I just want to look at that, that portion of verse 14. May I never boast of anything. Paul is living in a time, and the first century was known for this, a time of, and this is a, another Latin word, ego. Ego. The Latin word for I. People were becoming egocentric, that is, centered on themselves. Instead of being theocentric, which is centered around God, they had become egocentric. And then they had even become eccentric, which means that you're centered around outward things. And so Paul is dealing with cosmopolitan, first century, classical antiquity, um, men and women who are living in a time of a vast empire, materialism, worldliness. And there were many people who boasted about everything. And this was seen in, in, uh, of all places where it was seen, it was seen in no place more apparently than Corinth. 
Paul here, speaking to the Galatians, is warning them against being like the Corinthians. The Greeks in general were, were known for their boastfulness, for their wealth, for their extravagance, for the lavishness of their lives, the Macedonians, the Athenians, um, the Achaeans, um, the Spartans, not so much. The Spartans were, were a warrior culture, but certainly the Corinthians, known for their, their, um, their plush living. Even today, Corinthian leather um, is, is a staple of luxury. So Paul is warning the Galatians um, who were willing to be persecuted. So the Galatians had undergone persecution. He was warning them not to be tempted to be like um, so many other so-called believers because there were believers who still were very much um, of the world, very uh, much um, of, of the material world. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I in the world. This is almost identical to the language that we're going to see in 2 Corinthians 11. Um, Paul is wrestling against an egotistical world. He, he's dealing with um, egotism and, and egocentricity, and he's proclaiming against that. So... Um, he ultimately, again, verses 15 and 16, he says, For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. These rituals are nothing. But a new creation is everything. What Christ does in us is everything. And for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. He says the Israel of God, not the kingdom of Israel. The Israel of God indicates the new Israel, starting with the 12 apostles which replaced the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a different Israel. This is not a, a geographical entity. This is not a national entity. He is speaking of God's ideal family, the Israel of God. Finally, um, in verses 17 and 18, um, again, we've looked at helping one another through empathy, through service, that is helping one another by not being egocentric, but being Christocentric, that is centered around Christ, encouraging one another. Um, now we want to look at how we help one another by being brothers and sisters. Verse 17, from now on, let no one make trouble for me, for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. From now on, let no one make trouble for me. If, if we were looking at the letter to the Galatians as a plane taking off, this is taking us to the final parchment written to the Corinthians. People were harassing Paul at this point in his ministry. And Paul is at this point a seasoned rabbi and apostle. We can already hear him sort of um, tuning up um, um, to what would become the equivalent of a rap beef or a rap battle. This, this is Paul throwing a couple of shots and sending some shots across the bow over to the Corinthians. Let no one make trouble for me. This is his way of saying to the Galatians, because if you recall, he left Galatia and had gone to Greece. And now he's in Greece and people are making trouble for him. He is preparing for the only time in the New Testament where he's going to address people head on for all of their criticisms. And in doing so, he is stressing to the Galatians, focus on Christ. Don't focus on people. But at the same time, he's making it clear that there's an implication here. Although... It would seem I'm going to have to mention some particular groups of people, but you should not focus on people. You should focus on Christ. So he says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. May the grace, may the undeserved goodness, may the undeserved goodness of God in our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And he says, brothers and sisters, Adelphos, brothers and sisters. Um, so often in the church has been my tradition all throughout my life. I stress the title brothers and sisters or, or when it's um, pertinent, I stress titles, whether it be reverend or deacon or trustee or brother or sister, because those titles serve as reminders of the fact that we've been called apart and called above. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that is to say that we're not... Um, better than anyone, but we are called apart from others. So I always denote those titles in the church, brother or sister. So many times, as opposed to just using first names, you've probably noticed as pastor, I still use the title brother and sister, whether 
here on the church grounds or elsewhere. We don't stop being brothers and sisters because we're not on the church grounds. We're brothers and sisters wherever we are. It reminds us that no matter where we are in the world, the kindred that we share in Christ is stronger than any other bond. If you were to go to Thailand, for instance, and I have brothers and sisters in Thailand, the church doesn't change. The the, the sanctuaries, many of the litanies, they are the same all over the world. There are even elements of Catholicism and Protestantism that are still the same. Um, When I was once in in Mexico and I I walked by a church and I just happened to peek, peek my head in the church, certain things are the same. This is the reason for our orthodoxy. So even though the spirit works with us in different ways, there are certain things that don't change. And that's what keeps us together as brothers and sisters. So no matter what continent, no matter what country, no matter where you go in the church, there should be something stronger than any other bond, be it ethnic, racial, geographical, be it class based, be it gender based, be it anything. That kindred should be stronger than anything else. And so Paul says to this effect, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. And then he says, so be it in Aramaic, which is translated as amen. So be it or let it be so. And that concludes Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And in doing so, he starts to use that language. And this is if he's already seasoned and warmed up the pot and stirred the pot for what he's going to send to The Corinthians, um, over the course of numerous exchanges, by the time we get to chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, that is a part of the last parchment. He sends a collection of parchments and parcels to them. And we start to already see in this sixth chapter of Galatians some of the same language, but it's going to be more pointed whenever he sends it to the church in Corinth. So whenever we join for our next lesson next week, um, if you want to go ahead and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through 30, or I would recommend read all of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, read, read all of it to really give you that context. Because you might wonder if you start at verse 20, you might wonder why is Paul so heated? But you'll understand why if you read those first 19 verses to really see what he had been battling in terms of just trying to preach a clear message of the good news and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to preach the fact that we're new creations in Christ. Um, again, I thank you for this time of studying. Um, This particular week, um, I'm just going to pray for everyone and to pray for everyone's conditions, um, as I will be doing next week. But I just thank God for this time of study. Um, Nothing separates us from one another because nothing can separate us from the love of God. So be it distance, be it time zones, be it whatever it is, I'm just thankful that we can continue week in, week out consistently to always study God's word. Um, I just realized that since I've been here serving in this distinguished and honorable position as senior pastor of this great church that I've never missed a Bible study, except in December when I was told that we take two weeks off for Bible study. Um, But now with the blessing of pre-recording and with the blessing of streaming um, creatively, I'm still going to find a way to make sure that we have just that that weekly time, even if it's just a short um, weekly Bible overview during Christmas. It's just that even during Christmas, especially that's when we celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ. And so certainly um, it is just impertinent to me as pastor that I always teach and preach consistently week in, week out. And so I thank God for you for allowing me to do that. I thank God that you continue to allow me to share the truth and the strength of God's word. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your apostle that you sent to this earth 2,000 years ago following your ascension to the right hand of God the Father. Lord, we thank you that this letter speaks to us now. Help us to bear one another's burdens. Help us to pray for one another and lift one another up. Help us to serve one another. Help us to serve one another as brothers and sisters called by your holy name. God, I pray this evening for each and every parent that over the course of this year, 
has had to not only lead their households, but learn to become homeschoolers and at-home administrators. I pray for the strength of all parents. I pray for the strength of seniors who've spent so much of this year living in a type of virtual isolation in which they have had to, through creative means, find ways to remain connected with their loved ones. I pray for children continuing to be educated from afar and for teachers and administrators seeking to move forward. I pray for our nation. For God, you raise up kings and bring kings down. You bring up nations and you bring down nations. God, I pray that as we all weather what seems like the uncertainties of this time, that you will remind us that there is no need to be uncertain about anything. For you are always on the throne. You forever reign and hold the future in the palm of your hand. So God, I pray for our nation and every nation. For our first responders. Continuing to serve on the front lines. Risking their lives. Some of them giving their lives. Lord, I pray for our infants. For our babies, growing up in a world of turmoil and change and transition. Lord, create of this old world a new world for their sake. Lord, I pray for our churches. Every pastor, every deacon, every trustee and every bishop and every elder, every usher, every parishioner, for every minister of music, for every media ministry throughout the world that is serving and working to keep congregations and parishioners connected. God, we all need your grace. We all need your strength. We all need your help. We all need your upliftment. We all need your encouragement. We need you to wipe away our tears when we cry. We need you to shine upon us even on stormy days. Guide our feet when we get weary. Hold us up when it's difficult to stand. And God, with faithfulness, we will always look to you and give you the praise and give you the glory for sustaining us and keeping us. And this prayer we offer to you, O oh God, in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. May all of God's people say amen, amen, and amen. May God bless you. May you have a blessed evening. May the Holy Spirit keep you and protect you, and may the fullness of God rest upon you. God bless you.